from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's today's lineup. K-State's Walt Fick awaits to discuss putting together a drought management plan for summer pasture. He cites a brand new online tool that'll give you an idea of expected grass productivity based on regularly updated weather conditions. Also today, K-State's Megan Rolfe will tell of a new project she's overseeing, which aims to develop a heritable trait index for beef bull fertility, something that's lacking in today's cattle genetics information. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd reports this week on several landscape insect pests that you homeowners should be on the lookout for right now. All that and more directly ahead on this Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thanks for being with us. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, we're eyeing this grazing season that's now before us. It's underway across a fair part of Kansas now. There are also these associated concerns with potential dry weather and even drought creeping into the state once again at a high level this summer. And that brings to mind our topic today, planning for drought as part of your grazing program. Joining us once again is Range and Pasture Management Specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Walt Fick. Well, we don't know the magnitude of the drought to be, Walt, but uh, there are concerns out there, right? Yes, as you start looking at various tools we have available to us, like like the U.S. Drought Monitor, that's one I rely on quite frequently. And, and you know, you, you think back to the first of the year, uh, in fact, uh, Kansas, about 80, 81% of the state had some level of drought. Now, that has improved here as, as we've gone on. You know, March and April, we had some rain. And, you know, a week or two ago, we were only 26% of the state was under drought. But now that this last week, that's increased up to 36%. The areas with, with dry conditions Primarily in the western part of the state, I'd say, you know, the High Plains area. Uh, but this last week or so, now it's crept as far east as like Harper County. Yeah. Let's talk directly now about the new tool that's an experimental item online that producers could take a look at. This is about predicting or at least getting a, a relatively accurate projection on expected grass productivity on a localized level. Well, it's called grass cast. And you can find that very easily, you know, just doing a search online. Uh, like I say, it is an experimental tool, but, you know, it's kind of works for the Great Plains of the U.S., although I think they have also have some of the states in the southwestern part of the country in, involved. But here in Kansas, oh, you about cut Kansas in half, and it works from, from about, oh, if you to run a line from, let's say, uh, Jewell County through Ellsworth down to Harper County, from there west, uh, this uh, grass cast uh, does its prediction uh, based on some models. They've looked at such things as, as long-term uh, precipitation records. Uh, they do it on a per-county basis. They then also, I think, will look at what the seasonal climate outlook is. That's also taken into consideration. So they develop these nice color-coded maps for you by county, and it projects in, well, what happens if things are going to be, if you have normal precipitation during a period of time. I think right now they're, they're kind of looking at, we're, we're looking at mid-April through the end of August. Yeah, under normal precipitation, uh, this is the level of uh, production you might expect. Uh, then what if it's above normal? Or in case of drought, what if it's below normal? This data goes back some years, several they go decades. Back, yeah. They go back to uh, 1981, so, you know, 38-year period. So it's not a short-term database. has pretty good uh, numbers behind it. Uh, but like I say, it doesn't include our driest years on record necessarily, but we've had dry years since that time. 
most people maybe remember years like 1988, 2011, 12 uh, were also dry. And I know as I looked at some of those counties, some of the driest years, you know, Morton County, one of their driest years was 2011. You know, produced less than 600 pounds the acre of that particular, at least that, that was the projected production. Normal projection there would have been a little over 1,000 pounds. So, but it predicts uh, what that production levels would be. And, of course, then one could try to use that uh, in determining, you know, maybe what your stocking rates ought to be or, or if we are going to go into a drought period, we're going to have less than normal precipitation. We could expect a certain reduction, and there's some consequences if that happens. This grass cast tool will be updated regularly as the season progresses, including the latest on drought conditions, weather expectations, and so forth? I think it's pretty regularly updated, yes. It is found, by the way, at grasscast.unl.edu, but Walt notes it's just as easy to search for it, grass cast by name, and it's an experimental tool, really handy tool, for getting an idea of the likely grass productivity and the peak biomass for the season and uh, the historical trends that you see at any given county in the western half of the state. Do check that out. Walt, though, as far as taking that sort of information and crafting it into a drought management plan, and you hinted at destocking or changing stocking rates, several things producers can contemplate as what-ifs concerning their plan, right? Well, again, I think most drought plans usually have target dates that you need to make, try to make decisions. That first target date really ought to be before the season starts. How are things looking as you go into their growing or grazing season. We're past that for most places in the state at this point in time. So I think the next key target date might be June 15th. And the reason we picked that date out is because that's when about half of our forage production should have occurred. You know, so if one goes out and has a way of estimating what is the production right now, and you know what your normal end of season production will be, if it's not 50% of what that seasonal average ought to be, well, then you may need to start making some plans because automatically then you know you're not going to have as much forage probably produce that. Even if, even if it starts to rain uh, after that date, the plants just don't have the potential to produce what they would have normally if the precipitation had been in a more normal distribution. Mm-hmm. So you need to start thinking about what you might do. And, uh, you know, in the long run, we've always talked about, well, just stock conservatively, you know, at moderate stocking rate every year, you know. And usually even going into this year, I'd tell people I'd stock whatever you normally plan to stock because it's too early to tell. But what a good drought plan has in it is flexibility. We need to be able to adjust if conditions change and, and we need to, again, maybe consider destocking. Uh, that's pretty rare that you're going to take all the animals off, but you may indeed start reducing stocking rates to uh, accommodate lower forage production. Is there an easy way to get at just how much to destock, though? <laughs> or does a producer go by their general experience there? Well, again, I'd base it on, on the amount of forage production that's there. There there are formulas out there that we can determine, uh, again, what what the carrying capacity or stocking rate should be. I know I've put some numbers together uh, this morning looking at that, and if again, if, if you come to that middle of June time frame and let's say your normal production is 3,000 pounds per acre, and if you come to that time and production is maybe middle of June, it's only 1,000 pounds, that would be about a 33% reduction. Uh, and so that could tell us a little bit about maybe what we might do with, with our stocking rates if drought was going to continue. In other words, 33% reduction in forage? 33% reduction in animals out there. If, in you know, and, and what that does is that's all based on, you know, we, we want to leave a certain amount. Yeah. And, of course, so if we don't destock, production's not there. We're, we're going to be taking off more than we should. Other way of doing that, well, you might be able to maintain your, your current stocking rate, but you may have to come off the pasture earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, the number of days you can be out, rather than maybe going a full season till the first of October or even the end of October with cow-calf systems, pretty common. Maybe it turns out, yeah, i got to come off in September because I've run out of grass. So that's the other thing. Yeah, you can take animals out and maybe keep them out there longer, or 
You can keep out what you started with, but you have to take them off earlier. You mentioned cow-calf herds on grass. Well, things like weaning those calves early. Some of those other managerial steps that might help here. Yeah, that's pretty common, I think, what people have done. And historically, is if they get into a drought condition, is they'll, they'll wean early. And what that does, of course, in that cow's not lactating, doesn't need to lactate like she was. And her own needs are reduced by about a third. So that's a fairly effective thing to do because that's, that's a way of, re, quote, reducing stocking rate. I, again, I mentioned I use the term flexibility, and, and one of the good approaches I've always thought is, is if I am a cow-calf producer, uh, rather than maybe having the maximum number of animals that I can carry, is maybe reducing that back to maybe about 70% in any given year and making up the difference then with stockers. Stockers are a lot easier to get rid of, and then you don't have to worry about, oh, I've got to start getting rid of some of these cows I built years building up this herd, and I don't want to necessarily do that. Yeah. The other thing, though, with with a cow herd is is think about, okay, I've got these really good cows. I want to keep it all all cost, but then I've got some others that maybe I could get rid of or that aren't aren't uh, as important. You know, so you could kind of divide up your herd that way as well. So when if you need to destock. Uh, you can get, start getting rid of some of those animals. Point is, all of this is under that heading of forging a plan in case of drought conditions settling in for an extended time. Once more, we'd invite you to take full advantage of that tool that's called Grass Cast. If you'd like to get some semblance of an idea of the expected forage production on your pasture and uh, then match that up to your needs for the herd out on grass right now, just Google Grass cast. And here's hoping for timely rains to make all of these worries go away, Walt. Appreciate you coming by. Thanks for sharing all of this. Thank you, Eric. And by the way, he's authored an article on this very topic, which outlines that tool as well in the most recent Beef Tips newsletter out of K-State. You can find that at ksubeef.org. Walt Fick there, range and pasture management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Here on this Agriculture Today. For information on threatening weather, you should depend on the National Weather Service and their broadcast on NOAA Weather Radio. NOAA Weather Radio is an all-hazards radio network that provides up-to-the-minute weather information, including life-saving warnings anytime, day or night. NOAA Weather Radio also broadcasts information on man-made disasters, such as chemical spills, amber alerts, or other national emergencies. For the National Weather Service, I'm Bill Curtis. Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. Well, animal scientists here at Kansas State University are about to embark on a five-year project which will be funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's going to explore ways of defining beef bull fertility when one goes about their herd trait selections, their genetic management. And this is an interesting angle and one that's really not been pursued to this depth, we're told by the researcher spearheading this work, beef geneticist, K-State's Animal Sciences and Industry Department, Megan Rolfe. Megan, thanks for sparing a few moments and filling us in on the work that you're just starting on. We need to stress that. What's the driving force behind this? An absence of information on bull fertility? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me today. Really appreciate the opportunity to, to visit with you. And yeah, we're, we're really interested in male fertility from a genetic selection standpoint because there's not a lot of tools out there available within the industry to address that. We've done a pretty good job, I would say, from, from the female side developing selection tools, but we haven't used some of the data available to us from the male fertility side to develop tools for sort of the other half of that herd reproduction scenario. Those female traits, they've been used as a, a very much a roundabout way of getting at bull fertility potential, have they not? Yeah, so you're exactly right that anytime we, we focus on something related to conception, it's sort of partially due to the female and partially due to the male. And we have other tools out there like heifer pregnancy rates and things like that that are they're really more geared towards 
you know, replacement heifer selection and, and things like that. But what we don't really have is we don't have any tools that really get directly at semen quality of the male, for example. That's one of the items that you're really interested in as far as a trait. But as we get into this, you're looking at, obviously, Megan, heritable traits that can be measured and passed along then, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we've done a little bit of preliminary work in Angus animals. And what we've seen is that when we have these semen quality metrics, they're not always highly heritable, but they're kind of lowly to moderately heritable. And that means that we can select for animals that have better characteristics for these different traits. So it is possible to make improvement from a genetic selection standpoint. Bringing in your research and your approach here, exactly how will you attack this question? Ah, great question. So we're going to sort of tackle this from three different angles. The first angle we want to, because we're focused on the beef industry, right? The dairy industry has some of these tools, but for the beef industry, the first piece of data we're going to tackle this with are beef on dairy and any beef on beef conception records that we can get. So that's the first piece of data where we can really focus on something very analogous to what the dairy industry has in their sire conception rate selection tools. The other two pieces of information that we want to target really center around um, semen quality metrics. So we have some data from some bull stud partners that they've graciously allowed us to, to take a look at and look specifically at those semen quality measures that we take when we're collecting bulls for artificial insemination. And there's really extensive quality data associated with that. And the third piece of information is something that millions of beef producers around the country collect every single year. We just don't turn them in currently to breed associations and use that data. And that is from breeding soundness examinations. And so if you're buying a a yearling or an 18-month-old herd bull prospect, that animal's probably going to have had a breeding soundness examination. So that'll include basic information on, you know, the physical structure of the animal and things like that. But it also includes some basic semen quality metrics like motility and some basic data on abnormality. So all those are pieces of information that we can use to sort of try and put together this male fertility selection puzzle. So is the challenge in aggregating all of that and uh, creating a one-stop shop, if you will, for a fertility rating on a given sire? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big challenges with any selection problem where we probably have quite a few different component traits is that we don't necessarily want 20 more traits to select on, right? We already have a lot of economically relevant traits to select on. So one of our goals is to figure out which of those specific traits is sort of the most critical. And with the ability to develop tools with all of those traits, it's very possible that the most efficient way to do this in the future would be taking all that data and aggregating it into some sort of a selection index. So either an economic selection index or a specific, like a trait-specific male fertility selection index to make it that job a little bit easier for producers. Since you mentioned that uh, identifying traits that are most important here will be key to your work here, do you have any presuppositions as to what that trait or traits might be, the ones that would uh, lead the way here? Oh, that's a great question. And I don't know that I would hazard a guess on that one. Um, (laughs) I think we know sort of general categories like motility should be important. Obviously, we're not going to have great conception if we have a ton of abnormalities and morphology problems with the sperm and things like that. So I, I think it'll probably be a combination of a variety of different things. But that is something that we will look at. A bit about the timeline of the project then, Megan. It's it's over five years' time, so is it going to take that long to assimilate all of this information? How will this proceed? So some of the data we already have in hand, so we have some, some producers that have been generous enough to share data with us in some cases for more than a decade. We have our bull stud partners, as I mentioned, and we have some great breed association partnerships as well. So a lot of the early stages of this will just be getting all of that data together. And when you have data from multiple places, there's always things to do with, with making sure that the data is 
talking correctly and in the same format and things like that so that you can put it together. And then it'll really be about analysis. And we'll, we'll have results come out every once in a while as, as we're working on that. So, so we'll have some things before the five years is up, but uh, it will be a work in progress. Yeah. What you come up with, Megan, will it be uh, field tested, so to speak? Does the project give you enough latitude to do that? Well, that's that's a little bit of a challenge from a genetics standpoint, because anytime we're talking about genetics, it's, it's over a long time period, right? Mm-hmm. But one of the things that we do really want to do is to take the information that we have and not only understand sort of the fertility pieces of that, but the other really important thing, anytime you're thinking about developing a selection tool and using it within the industry, which hopefully our breed association partners really like it and and that's something that they want to provide for their membership, is how do these fertility traits relate to the other economically important traits? So do we have genetic antagonisms? Do we have traits that have favorable relationships. So if we select for one thing, do we have something else that we find desirable happen in another trait? So it's all about understanding those relationships between those different traits so that, you know, the industry can find the best way to move forward with that information. And that's important, the compatibility of traits for one's herd end goals, if you will. (laughs) That's always a moving target, Megan, but this, this particular data should contribute to that. Absolutely. So that's that's one of actually the really interesting things about economic selection indexes, which a lot of breed associations now have. So even when we have traits that have a genetic antagonism, so if we select for one, something we don't like happens in another trait, those relationships aren't one to one, right? So with the use of economic selection indexes or other types of selection indexes, we can really make progress in both of those traits, even though there's an antagonism present. And the other beautiful part of that is that it really sort of tackles that issue in a way where we're selecting on one value rather than a bunch of different EPD profiles. So it really simplifies things and lets us get at those genetic antagonisms. And and we won't get selection indexes built as a part of our particular project, but when we get done with our project, all the pieces will be there if breed associations have an interest in, in taking that step. And at the finish line, there will be hopefully a fertility EPD value on which the industry can hang its hat. Yes, hopefully so. That's the goal. Very good. And this ought to draw quite a bit of interest in the industry, you think, once once it's all said and done, because there's been this this void of this kind of information, Megan. Yeah, we've had a lot of enthusiasm thus far from, from both breed associations, from our bull stud partners, and from producers themselves. So it's not a trait that will be super economically important for every producer out there, but certainly for um, seed stock producers who are are big bull suppliers to the industry, these types of traits really have the possibility of of having a really positive impact to their bottom line. Indeed, it has the potential to be the next big step in beef genetics information, as within this project, you'll identify the heritable traits that lead to high-end bull fertility. And looking forward to this evolving as you go along here, Megan. Good luck to you and your research team, and we appreciate you letting us know about it right here. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. That's Megan Rolfe. Megan is a beef geneticist at K-State's Animal Sciences and Industry Department. Again, this is being supported by a grant from the USDA over a five-year research project looking at those traits, determining how they can be associated with beef, bull, fertility, and performance. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. We'll return shortly with more for you on the K-State Radio Network. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and agriculture today. Eric Atkinson back with you and with today's agricultural news headlines for you now, courtesy in part of DTN. 
in one of his first trips as administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency, Michael Regan met this week with a group of Iowa ethanol producers who stressed the potential for biofuels, lowering both emissions and cancer-causing chemicals. Regan, along with USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack, toured the Lincoln Way Energy Ethanol Plant in Iowa and hosted a roundtable discussion with ethanol producers. Regan later sent out some tweets highlighting his biofuels tour, one of those reading, Our agricultural community must have a seat at the table if we are to successfully tackle the climate crisis, again in Regan's tweet. The executive director of the Iowa Renewable Fuels Association, Monty Shaw, took part in that ethanol plant tour. He told DTN in an interview that Regan was engaged and that the ethanol group was also keenly aware that the newly the new administrator, that is, took an early trip to Iowa. The big message from ethanol producers to Regan was that ethanol is not a transition fuel, according to Shaw. He said that ethanol has a role to play long term in lowering greenhouse gas emissions and that the ethanol industry doesn't want the Biden administration to cut off ethanol demand by putting the finger on the scale for electric vehicles, in Shaw's words. Meantime, the USDA secretary says that recent Ag Stakeholder Roundtable demonstrated the farmer-led support behind developing new climate-smart-based economies and innovations. Here's more on that from the USDA's Rod Bain. I was very pleased with the level of support and interest that the farm community has for ways in which they can be engaged in this effort to reduce emissions and to be engaged in this climate effort. What are the takeaways from Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack from an Ag Stakeholder Roundtable held earlier this week in Iowa? The Secretary was joined by Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Michael Reagan in talking with farmers and ethanol producers about how the farm sector can take part in emission reduction and climate smart efforts. We had multiple questions about this in terms of how can we do this, not we're against it or we're opposed to it or we don't think it should happen. It was how can we do this? How can we be part of this? The secretary adds producers recognize the potential of new economic opportunities related to climate smart agriculture practices and innovations, with USDA having enormous capacity and enormous set of tools that could be used to provide the resources to work with the farm community to embrace this future. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. U.S. agricultural exports continue to climb, according to the latest USDA numbers. More on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. U.S. ag product export prospects looked dire a year ago, but now... It's quite a dynamic time. It's absolutely wild. USDA Outlook Chairman Mark Chekanowski and USDA Economist and Trade Tracker Dylan Russell. It's wild, all right. We have the ag export numbers for the first half of this fiscal year, and the total dollar value is... $92.4 billion. Last year's total at this time was 73.6. So Dylan Russell says that's almost 19% higher than the same time frame in 2020. March alone was a big export month, over $15 billion. And it's looking like it's on its upward trajectory for next month. It'll be interesting to see what the numbers are. And Mark Jekanowski, who heads the USDA Supply Demand Forecasting Unit, told us this time a year ago... I don't think many people would have ever predicted that we would be where we are right now. In fact, even you guys didn't. <laughs> In fact, you know, that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right, but it's all good. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And one of those proverbial ends of an era, the CME Group has announced it will permanently close most of its open outcry trading pits in Chicago. Ending one of the world's last vestiges of old-fashioned floor trading, the CME said that the number of trading pits that it closed temporarily in March of last year to prevent the spread of COVID-19 will not be reopened. Some of the CME pits being shut down include those for trading agricultural commodities, of course, floor trading for commodities has existed in Chicago since the mid-19th century, long part of the heritage of CME Group, which took its name from the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, now one of the company's subsidiaries. The rise of electronic trading has made floor traders nearly irrelevant in most financial markets. Exchanges have been shutting down trading pits in Chicago and elsewhere during the past two decades. Next up for you, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update Here's Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Chris Little is joining us. He is a professor of plant pathology at Kansas State University. And Chris, your ongoing research on investigating SDS in fusarium root rot resistance has run into some delays due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So let me ask, where do you stand right now as far as the project is concerned? Yeah, so I think we've all encountered a lot of uh, COVID delays this year with field work and closed labs and all those sorts of things. So hopefully we're getting back on track. We've got a full lab staff and a full set of experiments going on in the field this year. And so hopefully we'll be able to get things really moving. So we've done a lot of work in the lab to test some different types of assays to look at susceptibility and resistance in both commercial varieties and germplasm that's being put through the breeding program here at K-State. We found both susceptible and resistant materials, and also uh, doing some work in the field in Rossville and and Topeka, screening for field resistance as well. Another really important area is looking at fungicide resistance in these pathogens that are out there in the field, and that includes the SDS pathogen and some of the other fusarium fungus pathogens that cause root rot. And definitely we want to test things like azoxystrobin and fluteoxanil and some of the other commonly used active ingredients uh, in seed treatments and see if there's any uh, resistance in those pathogens to some of those active ingredients. And it, it turns out there are some variability there. The good news is, is that most of that material is going to be effective against all of your common root rot and SDS pathogens, but there are a few isolates, that is sort of strains of the pathogen, uh, that do show a little bit of resistance when we test those in the lab. Chris, with the project ongoing and some of the results obviously delayed, has it changed any of the objectives of the project itself? No, we're keeping the objectives the same. I think that the main delay has been, you know, kind of in increasing our collection of SDS pathogen isolates for testing in the lab and in the field. Certainly the COVID has reduced our ability to travel and to do some of those kinds of uh, survey sorts of studies, but definitely our pathogenicity assays where we're really trying to test a wide range of plant germplasm, plant varieties are certainly ongoing and top of the heap as far as priorities go. Chris, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks. That is Chris Little, professor of plant pathology at Kansas State University. He's been our guest on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And you're tuned to Agriculture Today. When you are in need of timely, reliable, and trusted information, K-State Research and Extension is here. Whether it's organizing people, information, or resources, they have the necessary tools. Community comes first for K-State Research and Extension. For more information and to connect with your county's extension agents, visit www.ksre.k-state.edu. Next up for you on this Agriculture Today, it's our weekly time set aside to talk horticulture. And aboard once more is Research and Extension horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd with a laundry list of insect activity that is occurring right now out there in the home landscape. Well, Raymond, let's start with a condition on pine trees, needle scale. It's probably as the name implies, isn't it? Yeah, right now, if people are aware, Van Hoot spirea is blooming, and those are the ones with the nice white flowers. And when certain plants are blooming, we know there's a certain level of insect and activity. And one of them is the pine needle scale. Pine needle scale is a hard scale which means you don't get the honeydew and sticky liquid you would for soft scales, but it attacks primarily pines, mugo pines, things like that. The the crawlers or nymphs will be out right now, and uh, if you look at your plants or you take a white piece of paper attached to a clipboard and knock branches over, you'll, you'll see the, the nymphs there. Well, this is the time to apply either a contact insecticide or a high-pressure water spray. Just dislodge them uh, before they develop into a stage that is not going to be bothered by insecticides as such. So uh, if you have a history on your mugo pines, you see these little white flecks on your pines, uh, that's pine needle scale. And this would be the time to uh, avoid having an infestation on your pines later on during the year. If left unchecked, will these scale inflict lasting damage on mugo pines? That's a good question, Eric. Depending on the size and the level of infestation, they can uh, inhibit the vigor of the trees. But again, they're also unsightly. You see these little flecks. looks like it's snow 
snow down your pine trees or whatever. But yeah, it's uh, and this every every organism has a weak link, and that weak link for pine needle scale are those crawlers that don't have a protective covering. So you could apply like an oil-based insecticide or insecticidal soap, which are contact, very benign, uh, don't last long, or a high-pressure water spray. Uh, we'll blast them off and they won't come back because it basically is very physically harmful to them. All right. But once again, be on the watch for pine needle scale. Yeah, and we have a, right, in fact, the next newsletter has an article, and uh, working with communications, we just developed a new pine needle scale extension publication. So that is available from the bookstore or online, and you can read more about pine needle scale in that publication. Very well. Revisiting quickly here, Raymond, lilac boars still active out there in home landscapes, you say? Yes. Again, it relates to a Van Hoot spirea blooming, Eric. And because of that, we know that lilac boar adult males and females will be out. They will mate. And then the females will lay their complement of eggs on the bark of a lilac tree, uh, also an ash tree. And uh, what you need to do is right now is you can apply a protective barrier like an insecticide. One of the active ingredients we, we recommend is permethrin. Those of you that deal with mosquitoes, you know permethrin is a repellent and an, and, and an insecticide. But when the eggs are laid and the larvae merge, they come into that barrier and they're killed. So that actually protects the trees or the shrubs from getting infected by the larval stage of the lilac borer. And once more, here's a pest that'll create quite a bit of havoc with lilacs and ash if left unattended. Well, it is a, it is a wood-boring insect, a caterpillar one. So if you get high numbers of them, uh, they can compromise the vigor of the tree, yes. Take measures to deal with that borer if, in fact, it's present on your ash or lilac. Back to the pines. Again, something that we mentioned last time out. Bring us up to date on the pine sawfly and its status. Yeah, the European pine sawfly, it, it looks like a caterpillar, but it's not. It's what we call a sawfly, which are more related to, well, the same orders, ants and bees. They should be out. I keep I keep going back to my, my sentinel trees and are not out yet. But they can devastate a pine tree by feeding on the terminal growth, and the pine tree doesn't look very pretty. Uh, one of the things we recommend is if you see branches with these uh, masses of larvae, they look like caterpillars. They're green initially. Just take a bucket of soapy water, shake the branch over it, and they'll fall in. They'll die. Uh, and do that regularly. That'll that'll uh, if you can. I know some tall trees you can't, but they should be out. Unfortunately, sometimes we'll have years with them and years without them. And we just kind of keep monitoring to see what those populations are doing at certain times of the year. Yeah. But if you see your pine trees starting their needles looking like they've been eaten, uh, if you come up to these branches and you see these green caterpillar looking organisms, they'll, they'll raise their front end. Those are European pine sawfly. Scout accordingly for yeah. those. Here's a pest which is quite evident when it shows up, and you say that uh, they're out now as well in uh, larger multitudes. The tent caterpillar, right? Yeah, the eastern tent caterpillar. I was out last week, uh, and I did see uh, one on uh, apple trees. Uh, they tend to feed on anything in the rosaceae family, pear, cherry, uh, and, uh, and crab apple. And uh, they build these nests, uh, very distinct. And they stay in the nest, so it's hard to get them with sprays, but I recommend taking high-pressure water spray or a rake and breaking it up, and then the birds will eat the caterpillars. I mean, they're one of our earliest defoliators, and so because of that, they can cause damage because they'll eat in the leaves. The leaves can't manufacture food, and, and the plant can be somewhat stressed as a result, or the vigor can be compromised as a result of that. Yeah. So we don't recommend spraying. Just take a forceful high-pressure water spray, Open up the nest and allow the birds to eat them uh, or whatever. But that's probably the, the probably the, the best recommendation at this point, Eric. And the elm flea weevil. Here's a pest we haven't discussed much, Raymond. What's it about? Yeah, the European elm flea weevil, Eric, has been around for a long time. And this is the time of year when the, when the elm leaves are out. Siberian Chinese elms. You'll start seeing these, these mines in the leaves. And that's the larval stage of this insect. It's a beetle as an adult. But both the larva and the adult will feed on the leaves. Once you start seeing the mines, uh, we recommend calling our arborist, because, uh, our certified arborist, to come out and deal with it, especially these large trees. But the larva will come out, fall to the ground, and then the, or sometimes they'll stay on the leaf, and then they'll become an adult beetle, which is a brown beetle, and it'll feed on the leaves, creating these kind of shot hold appearances. And that's that's the time you can apply an insecticide, but the timing can be very uh, difficult. 
Depending on the time of year they're out, yeah. You're calling for an arborist's intervention, which means this can be a pretty serious pest. Well, it could be. We have seen uh, certain years heavy infestations where most of the leaves, over 50%, have been uh, fed upon. And that's gonna, that can harm the tree in the long run if you get multiple years like that, yeah. Again, it's called the European elm flea weevil. Be watching for it, too. And you mentioned that you've extension publications on insect activity in lawn and garden that folks can lean on. Yeah, we've really built up the portfolio. We have vegetable garden pests, tree and shrub pests out there, and these are all available through the uh, KSRE bookstore uh, online as, as PDFs. Go to ksre.ksu.edu slash bookstore. Raymond, once again, a pleasure. In about uh, a month, we'll have you back again. Appreciate it. Always look forward to it, Eric. Always do. Thank you very much for having me on. Horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd, K-State Research and Extension, on this week's horticulture segment. That'll do it for our Thursday edition. As always, thanks for being along with us. Please rejoin us here tomorrow, won't you? Until then... Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.